Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present the eighth lecture in my series on the selected gross pathology of small ruminants. And we're going to talk about the musculoskeletal system. You've seen a number of these defects before, especially in our last lecture on the nervous system, because as I'm always given to say, where the defectively developed nervous system leads, the musculoskeletal system will also follow. Well, we have a couple of other lesions, specifically of the musculoskeletal system, to discuss in this segment. But before I do that, I want to thank all of my friends and colleagues, as I always do, who provided me these fantastic images, either through journal publications, collated collections, or directly over the years, which allow me to put these lectures together. Let's start with a disease that we talked about in the last lecture as far as its effect on the nervous system. And it's sort of a good prototype for a number of viral infections caused by Bunya viruses. These particular viruses are seen in various parts of the world, some in America, some in Japan. And the next group of pictures are from an outbreak of one in the early 2000s, which was seen in Central Europe and started in a town called Schmallenberg, Germany. So this virus is called the Schmallenberg virus. We're looking at a severely deformed fetus, which exhibits a number of findings. You have abnormal curling and contraction of the legs, which is known as arthrogryposis. There also is a throwing back of the head, known as torticollis. And we can also see uh, a craniofacial abnormality, which has resulted in foreshortening of the mandible, or breaking nathia inferior. If we were to look at the nervous system of this animal, there would be significant defects uh, within the cerebrum, possibly the cerebellum, and likely the spinal cord as well. One of the main causes of arthrogryposis in animals is defective development of the nervous system. That's why we say where the nervous system leads, the musculoskeletal system will follow. And the easiest way to think about it is to remember that muscles require innervation to develop or even to continue at the normal size in an adult animal. If you denervate a muscle, it will atrophy and contract. If there is no innervation due to a defective nervous system uh, during development, it won't develop. So many of what we would imagine would be skeletal muscles uh, are actually thin flat bands of fibrous connective tissue. And so they never grow enough so the legs are able to distend. There's a great Wednesday slide conference of the muscles of these animals back in 2012, if you want to check them out. Um, let's look at a couple of other images from these animals. And here you can see we're looking at the pelvis here, and we have this tremendous twisting of the spinal column because of the orientation. It's sort of difficult to make out whether this is kyphosis, lordosis. It certainly uh, exhibits a lateral uh, disorientation, so we can call it severe scoliosis. A lot of times those, those three uh, things are, are uh, brought together in various combinations, and this would certainly be one. Just a, another picture of one of these markedly deformed lamb. Here we have uh, lordosis as well. Lordosis again here with the uh, spinal column curving up. But you can see these significant craniofacial abnormalities, the defective development of the limbs, and some craniofacial, obviously, abnormalities in this one all going back to the fact that, that uh, the cerebrum, cerebellum and spinal cord are not developed due to the early infection 
of the germinative cells of the central nervous system by viruses which result in necrosis and, and they never develop. I think that it probably is a, a good time just to mention other causes. Certainly one of the first things I think about when I see arthrogryposis in, uh, in ruminants or any species is going to be viral infection. Those are most common in our ruminant species. Um, very uncommon in other species. But that's not the only way that you can develop uh, arthrogryposis. Um, Certainly, arthrocoposis can be seen in other uh, viruses besides uh, the Bunya viruses. It's also seen in uh, other flaviviruses like Rift Valley fever, Wesselbrod disease. It can be seen in pestiviruses, bovine viral diarrhea, anything that causes a defect in the development of CNS often will cause musculoskeletal abnormalities. Uh, one of the, the key things about the development of the limbs in animals is that fetuses don't just lay there as anybody who has uh, had children know that the, the fetus after a certain point is constantly moving and kicking extending those legs and and that is part of the development process and without the freedom of movement uh, that you get you will not be the legs will not be developed and the animal will be born in one of these contracted positions uh, this has been seen with a number of plant toxins, including ponderosa pine, which causes prolonged and sustained uterine contractions in animals that are grazing uh, ponderosa pine needles. And so with the uterine not contracting, the animal can't extend and, and the fetus will be born in an arthrocarpotic state. We also see that with abnormalities of fluid content in the uterus, where there's just too much fluid and too much pressure in the animal does not have the ability to move properly. So you can see that with various forms of high drops. And then there are congenital uh, abnormalities or constellations of birth defects known as arthrogryposis multiplex congenita, which are pretty well Defined. There's not a pre-existent viral infection, but these animals are born as these so-called crooked calves or crooked lambs due to a complex and a varying degree of a musculature and, and tendinous contracture. So those are a couple of ways, and I don't really know the, uh, the possibility of what's going on here. These could have been viral due to ovine pestivirus infection or whatever. We have two arthropropotic lamps. One is yellow. And uh, I just want to mention for, especially for those of you who are starting out in pathology, that uh, uh, when you see the yellow discoloration in the hair of a calf or a lamb or a foal, you know that it has been a difficult birth, or maybe a dystocia. The membranes have ruptured. The animal is contaminated with uh, uh, it has defecated within the amniotic sac and it contaminates itself with a sterile uh, a bit of feces called meconium. And uh, it will inhale this, it will swallow it, you will see meconium discoloration in the lungs. Usually uh, it is fairly mild in nature and not a problem, but in severe cases uh, you can have fatal cases of meconium aspiration. Just to remember and to simplify that these animals discolored by their own feces during birth have had a traumatic birth and uh, certainly should be watched over with care in the postpartum period. Here is a, another uh, disease that we talked about in the last lecture because of its severe effects on development of the central nurses. Some of the most severe effects. This is Veratrum species, false hellbore Veratrum californicum. And if the dam eats this within a very significant and particular window of gestation between 12 and 16 days, there will be interference. Uh, cyclopamine, a toxic principle, will interfere with the transduction of the sonic hedgehog gene, which causes in the normal state 
the brain to separate into two halves, development of bilaterally symmetrical structures of the brain, including the rhinencephalon, the optic nerve, and ultimately uh, the eyes. Uh, when this does not occur due to the ingestion of this plant, then these animals have a single lobe of their cerebrum, their eyes are fused, and uh, the musculoskeletal system will adapt to house those structures. And then these animals become cyclopean with a single orbit um, because there is no development of the olfactory lobes. They don't develop a nose. They may develop something that resembles a nose on top of their head called the proboscis. Um, so it's a, a very significant uh, craniofacial defect. It's not compatible with life and it's due to ingestion of this particular plant. Now we do see similar congenital defects in all animal species including humans. It's not that they're eating this particular plant but but they obviously have some congenital defect that prevented the expression of these homeobox or sonic hedgehog genes. So it could be a spontaneous defect in any animal species. And just to remember that uh, this particular plant can, can cause musculoskeletal defects in two different windows, one to 12 to 16 days, uh, and the second is, the, uh, is later on in gestation, about day 28 to 30, where these animals have foreshortened limbs and become chondrodysplastic dwarfs. Okay, a couple of other congenital abnormalities. Here is one that, wow, it is really difficult to figure out exactly what's going on here. We have what appears to be about one and three quarters lamb, all bundled up in one. We have a head here. This one looks fairly normal, but here is a second conjoined twin or fetal monster, whatever you want to call it, that uh, has what appears to be everything except a head. Uh, I can't imagine that that animal is going anywhere uh, anytime soon with all of those legs. Um, fetal monsters will routinely cause dystocia um, and uh, it is not unlikely that the dam was probably killed uh, or died during a very difficult birth. Another congenital defect um, which often accompanies a defect in the caudal spinal cord is spina bifida. There are certain breeds of sheep including dorper sheep in which uh, um, the two go together. This animal obviously has been shaved a little bit. The, the severity can be uh, very severe where you actually can see the spinal cord or the, uh, or the uh, bodies of the vertebra going all the way down. This one is pretty mild. This one actually is limited to uh, a lack of closure of the skin over the uh, caudal spinal cord, but you can see everything in between and even with this mild defect it may be associated with significant problems in the animal uh, being able to urinate or even move its hind limbs. Moving on to a defect of the developing musculoskeletal system, um, which was identified in the early 1990s. Uh, this is a problem that is seen in uh, uh, black faced sheep like Suffolk's and Hampshire's. <coughs> and because of the appearance of the animals affected with this, their long spindly legs, which are often crooked, it has been given the name spider lamb disease, uh, even, even called in some quarters inherited arachnomelia. That's a good one. Um, spider lamb disease is an autosomal recessive condition with complete penetrance that results in, in generalized chondrodysplasias in Suffolk's and Hampshire's and, this, these, and their crosses. Um, 
<coughs> excuse me, the ultimate defect in these animals is the formation of multiple and abnormal centers of ossification in a number of bones, which give rise to abnormal development and direction. Um, this particular animal should have a nice flat face, and you can see an outward bowing of the face. This is known as a Roman nose, and <coughs> is one of the characteristic findings in these particular animals. They often have long legs, uh, which are especially noticeable at birth, and a combination of varus or valgus deformities. The disease is the result of a single point mutation in the tyrosine kinase domain of fibrogla fibroblast growth factor 3. Fibroblast growth factor 3 acts to inhibit chondrocyte proliferation and terminal differentiation. So it's a controller of proliferation of cartilage at the uh, uh, at the physis and ultimately limits elongation but it doesn't work very well in these animals and and part of the reason it is part of the reason that they develop see this is the physis of one of the long bones and you can see that it is bent and there are this physis instead of being linear um, there are multiple <clears throat> small physes within it. Um, so this bone is, is developing and growing every which way. It is sort of weak and susceptible to the pressure of the animals, which worsens the valgus and, and, and deformities of the limbs. Other changes that you can see in these animals besides the nose and the limbs are significant changes in the vertebra of the spine spinal canal. So you will have severe scoliosis and other changes here. And if you take a look, you can see these areas of cartilage traversing the vertebra. Uh, histologically, this can be a very difficult uh, biopsy to read. And uh, I remember it was on my certification exam. It was the second slide and I looked at it and I had no earthly idea. Now this was right when it had come out, so it probably wasn't as ingrained in the literature, and I certainly had missed that important bit of information. So uh, it was about 12 minutes of panic for me that day, but it all worked out fine. So this is spider lamb disease, a defect in fibroblast growth factor 3, resulting in elongation and abnormal growth of the bones of the face, the vertebral column, and the legs. Well, <clears throat> here's a, a, a <clears throat> lamb um, who can't move, who's have, having trouble breathing, and all four legs are in extension. Looks like they may have or may have involuntary urinated here. And the reason that the legs are in extension is this animal is uh, has tetanus. Tetanus is a clostridial disease uh, in which these bacilli gain access to the body through a puncture wound, which then heals, uh, providing the bacterium the uh, anaerobic conditions that it needs to proliferate and to release a toxin, which is known as uh, tetanospasm. Tetanospasm is a neurotoxin which is very particular about the uh, these cells that it affects. Uh, it affects the Renshaw cells within the spinal cord. If you've not heard about Renshaw cells before, don't feel bad. But they serve a very important purpose. The lower motor neurons of our spinal cord without the inhibitory effect of Renshaw cells would continually fire and we would find ourselves much like this in a constant state of excitation of the muscles of our entire body, but these Renshaw cells release a, uh, an inhibitory uh, factor largely based uh, with, on glutamine. 
Um, but these are the cells that are targeted by tetanospasm. They are unable to release their inhibitory substances, and it allows these lower motor neurons to consistently fire. Uh, these, these unfortunate animals um, go through a period of stiffening and ultimately will die due to an inability of being able to breathe properly on um, the muscles of the the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles simply don't work and that's the usual cause of death in animals or people uh, with tetanus. The only thing that, that will mimic this is strychnine poisoning which also causes uh, extensor rigidity in affected animals by a different mechanism. Now one of the things that you will see in animals is that all four legs will be in extensive rigidity. Uh, in people or other bipeds, uh, the front legs are brought in into what's known as a pugilistic pose. And that's simply because uh, in, uh, in bipeds, especially humans, the, the, your biceps muscle is stronger than the triceps. So that is the one if there's a battle as to, you know, which is going to win the biceps in non-human primates and primates will win that battle and the arms will be contracted rather than an extension. You can see this animal or this this human uh, all of the muscles are in extreme uh, contraction and if you look closely at the face of somebody with uh, tetanus the lips will be drawn back into a tight grimace which has been referred to classically as the sardonic smile of tetanus, certainly not a way to go. Okay, we're looking at the cross section of long bones in this young sheep. And one thing I want you to notice that the physis, which normally is a single relatively flat line, is very irregular. It is asymmetric there are areas that are much larger than normal and that is because this animal has a condition known as rickets. Rickets is a lack of vitamin D or active vitamin D um, and vitamin D is a very important compound. Uh, to begin with um, we see rickets in animals who are deficient in vitamin D. We see rickets in animals, uh, at least in mammals, who do not have access to sufficient uh, sunlight during development, such as veal calves, uh, because vitamin D goes through uh, a systemic production in the body. It has to be activated by UV light. So not having access to sunlight is is almost as bad as not having any vitamin D in your diet at all. Well, the importance of vitamin D is that it is the gatekeeper of mineral entry into the body. In the intestine, it opens the gate and monitors those gates for the influx of calcium. Animals without activated vitamin D cannot bring in enough calcium. Well, how does this affect the bone? Um, as you know, the development of physis results in a, a complex process of cartilage production, cartilage necrosis, cartilage mineralization, and cartilage reshaping by a variety of cells, including osteoblasts and osteoclasts. And the osteoblasts will put down uh, osteoid on the uh, the cartilage remnants of the distal end of the physis. And then that osteoid will be mineralized and will be remodeled to its final shape by osteoclasts. But osteoclasts are very picky and they will not remodel osteoid that has not been mineralized. I like to, to equate it to eating potato chips with no salt on them. Nobody wants to eat potato chips with no salt, and osteoclasts will not remodel this osteoid, which is perfectly normal, just doesn't have 
the mineralization or the salt, so to speak. And so it continues to grow. It is unremodeled by the osteoclasts, and the animal will develop rickets. Uh, one of the important things to to remember in this particular slide is that that physis, um, even in, in the rachitic animal, is not, as you would think, it was just not a, a diffusely thickened band, but it's very segmental. It's very focal, it's very uneven, and that's the typical picture of rickets. A little counterintuitive because you think that the whole thing would be the same, but, but it's not. Um, I, I will also mention that animals with that have decreased amounts of calcium mammals generally do not develop rickets. There is enough calcium in the bone that they are able to mobilize that to 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 uh, get through their their normal day. But during development, there is that increased amount that they can't produce. That uh, you do have to have activated vitamin D to uh, you know it really doesn't seem to matter what time of the day I do this uh, somebody always finds me and calls I'm, I'm recording this right now at 8 o'clock in the morning and that's usually a safe time so I apologize for the interruption so to get back to it the only species that uh, a calcium deficient diet will result in rickets in uh, are poultry. So poultry can get it as a result of no vitamin D and, or, no, or a diminished amount of calcium. Usually mammals, it has to do with vitamin D deficiency, not so much the calcium. Okay, here's a disease that is well known in certain uh, breeds of sheep. And I do want to talk about it because it's a very interesting disease. Normally, almost every uh, uh, disease of the bone or malnutrition um, will result in a variety of osteoporosis, in which, uh, or osteopenia, in which you get a decreased amount of bone produced. You may only have 70% of normal bone, or 50%, or 30%. Um, but the bone usually is of good quality. Okay, It's just a diminished amount because you don't have enough either uh, energy coming in. A grocerosis is a form of, or a major contributor to osteopenia. Uh, or you have decreased mineral. Um, there is only one condition in which uh, you have a decreased amount of bone as well as decreased quality of bone. The bone that is made is not normal. And that is a condition that is known as osteogenesis imperfecta. It's also associated with uh, uh, skin fragility as well. This particular condition is an autosomal dominant condition resulting from mutation of the COLA1 or the COLA2 genes. And these are genes which in osteoblasts uh, will code for alpha-1 and alpha-2 change of the procollagen molecule. So with defective procollagen, the, the traditional collagen molecule, which is uh, uh, three bands of collagen um, is defective, poorly formed, and weak. So the bone itself is defective and weak. Uh, if we look at these animals that come out, they generally have a number of fractures that are required in utero or shortly after birth. Uh, this is from an animal that lived uh, for a while afterwards. It is not in itself conducive to stillborn or abortions, but the animals really have a lot of trouble because their bones are incredibly brittle. They s snap easily. And 
here's a row of fractures. You wouldn't confu excuse me, confuse this with rickets in which you will have mushrooming at the costochondral junction. But these are, are across the ribs um, in a linear area. And, and these fractures, which involve every single bone in this line, um, probably were the result of uh, the birth process. Uh, these animals will also have broken legs, etc. It has been documented uh, and well investigated in people, seen in a number of other animal species, including cats. So, um, less bone than normal, improperly formed is the province of osteogenesis imperfecta. Almost all of our other changes, uh, which involve osteopenia or decreased production of bone. A lot of people ask, what's the difference between osteopenia and osteoporosis? Uh, to my knowledge and understanding over the years, having asked a lot of people and gotten uh, uh, many different answers, osteopenia is the defective, or the production of, or the diminished, excuse me, the, the diminished production of bone as a result of diminished mineral or energy content in the diet. Osteoporosis is the superimposition of pathology on that bone, especially pathologic fracture. Uh, so osteoporosis goes along with pathology. Osteopenia is essentially a nutritional uh, process. And osteogenesis imperfecta is the one that combines the two very nicely, diminished production, and defective bone. Uh, more fractures due to parturition. Uh, in this case, there is a rupture of a intercostal artery and hemorrhage. Um, so this is an animal probably that uh, uh, died very shortly after parturition. You can occasionally see these animals in uh, uh, these wounds in young animals who are born normally. And uh, I don't agree with the conventional wisdom that uh, they were stepped on by the mother or something like that. That's very unusual uh, behavior, except in confinement. Uh, uh, large sows may roll over on piglets simply because they don't have any place to go. But uh, um, I just have not seen mothers trample their offspring. They're very uh, careful around them. So I would always look for something uh, as far as uh, bone fragility in these types of bone. And you know, a, a normal rib in most animals, you should not be able to easily break. Uh, you want to break it, hold it away from you with a convex surface away to make it even a little more difficult and try and break it. If you can snap it, there's probably something wrong with it, especially in any adult animal. Um, so, and obviously it depends on the size of the animal. You can easily break the rib of a mouse. But uh, when we're talking about adult sheep or, or horses or something like that, it is very difficult to break a rib with your bare hands just using your thumbs. Okay, we're looking at uh, uh, the skeletal muscle of a sheep or a goat, and you can see that there are large streaks of variable degrees of pallor. And this is, uh, as you would imagine, white muscle disease. White muscle disease is a disease resulting from abnormal uh, amounts of selenium or vitamin E in the diet. Uh, in small ruminants, sheep and goats, uh, it can affect animals between uh, one week and four months. Um, it may result in sudden death as a result of damage to the heart, which is also affected as well as the skeletal muscles. Um, in, more, in, in more mature animals, 
uh, these animals are reluctant to move. They're stiff and they may uh, stand a sawhorse pattern and their muscles may be painful to touch. Usually they're treated with an injection of a selenium and vitamin E in the more acute cases. Um, remember in very young animals, the, anim the muscles that are used are the ones that are affected primarily. So you may see lesions in the ones they use on a regular basis. I would look at the muscles of deglutition because they are nursing. Even if they're not standing well, they're nursing. So those muscles may be predominantly affected. Uh, the intercostal muscles, because they are breathing, those may have uh, streaking. And then obviously in the older animals, especially the ones that don't want to walk, I would check the muscles, especially of the hind limbs. But uh, it is not always an intuitive pattern. And remember that it affects both cardiac and skeletal muscles. So white muscle disease an imbalance of selenium and vitamin A. If you look at the literature on white muscle disease, um, it varies in different parts of the world. Uh, some places say, no, we got plenty of selenium here, it's got to be a vitamin E. And some say, well, these animals were on a poor diet. So I have just skirted the issue over the years. So whenever anybody asks about the cause of, of white muscle disease or hepatosis, dietetica, and pigs or whatever, I just say selenium of vitamin E imbalance and drive on. Uh, this is one that uh, we have a combination of things here. This is not unusual uh, if you work in any type of, uh, type of diagnostic lab, especially in goats and older goats. For some reason, people seem to, to feel that goats can survive on anything. Uh, there's a myth that goats eat anything and, and they are a little bit more indiscriminate than other species, but they certainly can't survive. And, and you see goats come in in various uh, advanced stages of emaciation and parasitism. And you just have to have to shake your head about, about some people. Uh, perhaps it's because you can buy a goat uh, for less than it takes to take good care of the goat. But one of the things that we so often see in, in goats coming through the diagnostic laboratory is uh, a total lack of body fat and all of the fat in the body has been, uh, has been mobilized, leaving a gelatinous material behind. This is the bone marrow, which normally should have a fair amount of fat in, uh, and in older animals, you have more fat in the bone marrow than you have uh, production, producing bone marrow. And that's just the nature of, of getting older. But here you could simply take the bone and you could pour this material out. So this is severe serous atrophy of fat. It was mirrored in the rest of the animal's body. And you could simply just pour that out. The other thing that you should notice, and it goes back to one of the major causes of osteopenia. Well, there's very little... Uh, medullary bone here. The cortices are very thin. Um, and this goes back to the fact that you, to make bone, you have to have energy in your diet, protein and calories. So animals that are starved um, will generally be osteopenic as well. So a combination of osteopenia and serous atrophy and fat indicating an advanced malnutrition of this unfortunate goat. Uh, we have these white nodules in the muscle of this sheep, and these are larval cestode forms. This is Cystocircus ovus. We're looking at the uh, Cystocirci. Uh, after ingestion of dog feces, because the adult tapeworm is a tapeworm of dog, so if an animal grazes where an animal ha where a dog has deposited the eggs, it will swallow the eggs. The the embryos will penetrate the uh, the wall of the gut, get into the portal system, and ultimately to the uh, systemic circulation. And this type of parasite actively looks for metabolically active areas of the body, including cardiac and skeletal muscle. So you will see the cystocerci 
prop, uh, primarily in the muscle. Uh, these look viable, and then they will complete the life cycle if this animal dies and is eaten uh, by a dog who ingests this. And each one of these says the cerci will become one tapeworm in the gut of the dog. Uh, it, these particular uh, tinnid tapeworms uh, are seen in small ruminants. They're also seen in cattle. They give rise to, uh, they're seen in pigs, and they give rise to a condition uh, known uh, by butchers as measly pork or measly beef. I've never heard of measly mutton, but uh, if we were going to call something, we would probably call that as well. So uh, striated muscles, heart, skeletal muscle, especially those of the jaws because they're constantly going in and metabolically active. Um, the other rule out, and it's not and it's a poor rule out, but sarcocysts in muscle, they're generally not as round or raised. Uh, but if if these were flatter, it may be surrounded by some greenish discoloration uh, because sarcocyst infection can result in eosinophilic myositis. I suppose I would consider that, but this is a pretty good uh, case of, of cystocircus ovus in small ruminants. Let's look at the joints as well. Um, we'll put those in musculoskeletal. And we talk about small ruminants. Small ruminants get, especially the young ones, get the entire range of bacterial polyarthritis as, as uh, calves do. Um, as a result of joint ill, you may have uh, systemic infection. And one of the many places that they will go fairly readily is to the joints and, and any young animal with multiple swollen warm joints probably should, should be considered a major suspect for polyarthritis. I'm going to ignore a lot of that and I want to look at some of the more chronic infections with the last couple of, of slides in this particular lecture. Um, there is one viral cause, especially in goats, uh, of of joint swelling, chronic joint swellings, especially of the carpal joints, and that is the lentivirus that causes caprine arthritis and encephalitis, also known as the CAEV uh, virus, caprine arthritis and encephalitis virus. Uh, probably the most common manifestation, whereas in, it can cause encephalitis in young goats, it will commonly cause pneumonia uh, and mastitis as well, but maybe the most common manifestation in goats is the formation of bilateral carpal hygromas. There's a lot of fibrous connective tissue and uh, inflammation, lymphocytic inflammation uh, in these particular joints. So you can also see something uh, very similar in sheep. Uh, infected with the lentivirus that causes ovine lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia. But it does not affect the joints with the routine nature that we see in goats. So bilaterally, and, that, and the key is bilaterally, uh, symmetrical carpal swelling in, in goats, you have to consider the possibility of lentiviral infection. It could certainly be bilateral chronic suppurative inflammation. Uh, this is a case of uh, mycoplasma capricolum uh, in the uh, uh, the joints of a goat. Great picture by Federico Giannini. And uh, this particular mycoplasma causes a condition in goats called Q, uh, contagious caprine pleuronomonia. Remember mycoplasma mycoides will cause bovine pleuronomonia. And one thing about the mycoplasmas, uh, a lot of them do cause chronic uh, suppurative joint infections. This is not just pus and fibrin. There's a multiple layers of fibrous connective tissue. Um, it results in a severe, highly destructive um, polyarthritis in goats. And it's also been found in other ruminant species, including uh, uh, sheep and cattle.
This is a, a chronically deformed joint, and you can see that there are large areas of uh, cartilage, synovial cartilage loss at the edges of this joint. There are osteophytes here. Um, I find it very difficult sometimes to evaluate the center of joints because if this is where tendons insert, you don't have a lot of, of uh, cartilage there. But the presence of osteophytes and the ebernation and loss of cartilage, especially on the parts of the joint that, that meet each other, um, is highly significant uh, findings for chronic osteoarthritis. And uh, we see this in older animals, older sheep, older goats. So uh, that should be one of your rule outs. It shouldn't all be bacterial and viral. Uh, chronic osteoarthritis in an old animal is not uncommon. And finally, um, one particular uh, neoplasm of bone in small ruminants, and you can also see it in cattle and horses, but it's very particular to the symphysis of the mandible or even in the maxilla to a lesser extent. And these are ossifying fibromas. They go by a number of other names, including cemento ossifying fibromas and peripheral uh, ossifying fibromas. They are generally uh, slowly growing singular neoplasms that really like this particular area of the body. I've heard one or two pathologists refer to them as localized fibrous osteodystrophy. I'm not as sold on that particular diagnosis as I am on the diagnosis of a, a very characteristic neoplasm, ossifying fibroma. So whenever I see, especially in a young animal, a tumor of the end of the jaws, I'm going to default to ossifying fibroma um, and then I'm going to have to rely on the microscope to tell me the ultimate answer. Well, that brings us to the end of this lecture. We only have a couple more in this series. Our next one will be on the uh, integumentary system, so I hope you'll come back uh, to wherever you are viewing these lectures, whether it is Facebook, whether it is uh, the Joint Pathology Video Library, or on the uh, Davis Thompson Foundation YouTube channel. I hope you are enjoying them as much as I am enjoying uh, making them available and putting them together. And as always, I wish you good health, great happiness, and please be safe. I'll see you next time.